News of the Times, History News Collection. A collection of stories of punishments and execution methods. As we promised some time ago, this is a follow-up collection to our episode Unique Execution Methods in English and French History from 1542 to 1684. In this episode, we look at some stories relating to different execution methods. These include stories relating to Little Ease, St. Catherine's Wheel or Being Broken on the Wheel, Drowned in a Vat of Wine, Messy Beheadings, The Maiden, The Guillotine, and our last story in this episode, The Unique Torture of Gatching. The recorded stories range between mid-15th century to 1896. We hope you enjoy the show. We start the show with the torture cell named Little Ease. There was a Little Ease torture cell in both the Tower of London and Newgate Prison. The description and related story is below. Little E's torture cell, most notably used during the Tudor reign. The Little E's torture cell is located in the Tower of London. There is also a Little E's cell in Newgate Prison. The Tower of London cell measures 1.2 metres square, or 3 foot 9 inches by 3 foot 9 inches. The room has no window, so it is in constant darkness. The small room size made it impossible for the prisoner to find any position other than to crouch. Prisoners would often be left in the room for several days as a preliminary to interrogation. Infamously, Guy Fawkes was said to have spent time in little ease, but folklore does have Guy Fawkes going through every torture listed in the Tower of London during his time. The story of Alice Tankerville and John Board. It is 1531 and a shipment of gold coins destined for Henry VIII's royal treasure arrives at the London docks only to find the chest completely empty. The chest had been sealed, locked, chained to the floor of the ship and under constant guard, but upon arrival, the chest was found empty. Henry's anger was immense. With meticulous investigation, John Wolfe, a crew member of the ship holding the treasure, became the primary suspect and was arrested. John had a history of petty theft and piracy. John became a guest of His Majesty in the Tower of London in 1533. One of his allowed visitors was his common law partner, Alice Tankerville. Alice herself had her own reputation as a pirate, murderer and thief. Alice frequently visited John in the Tower, bringing him clothes, food and wine. During her visits she became friendly with prison guard John Board. Eventually John was released as evidence was found lacking. John immediately absconded to Ireland. However, six months later additional evidence came to light implicating John and also, as his potential partner in crime, Alice Tankerville. In the meantime, Alice and John, who had returned from his flight to Ireland, continued their thieving ways with the murder and robbery of two merchants from Italy. They were both caught and thrown into the Tower of London. Alice was reportedly shackled to the walls of her cell by both hands and her feet, making escape impossible. On March the 23rd, 1534, Alice, with the prison guard John Board beside her, made her escape from the Tower of London with rope and the keys to her restraints. They managed to escape out of the Tower onto the 
leads of what is known as Traitor's Gate, and using the rope slid down to the wharf into a boat waiting for them. From here they crossed the moat, doing their best to avoid the guards to reach the horses that were tied and waiting for them to make good their escape. Just as they were approaching the horses, night guardsmen with lanterns approached. They attempted to avoid detection of the light, but John was recognised, and they soon realised he was with escaped prisoner Alice Tankerville. John admitted he had planned the escape of Alice Tankerville, as he said, for the love and affection he bore her. The capture is recounted here. On Friday, about two of the clock, in the morning, one board, the Lord Lieutenant's servant, came with the counterfeit keys and opened the prison door where John Wolfe's wife was and conveyed her out of the tower with ropes tied to the embattlements and after he had conveyed her down, went down himself. On the wharf below they hid for an hour, then board, found a boat, and rowed them to the water stairs at the end of the Tower Causeway. They were walking up Tower Hill towards a Mrs. Jenny's house, where Board had left two horses, when they encountered the watch. By Grenville's account, Alice was apparelled like a man, and for that reason the watch was suspicious, and they took both Alice and Board into custody and took them to the Lord Lieutenant. Sentence was pronounced. Wolfe and his wife, Alice Tankerville, shall hang upon the Thames at low water mark in chains, and Board is in little ease, and after he has been in the rack, he shall be hanged. As for the missing gold, it was never found. A few other cases of prisoners sentenced to time in little ease. On the 3rd of May, 1555, Stephen Haps, for his lewd behaviour and obstinacy, committed this day to the tower to remain in little ease for two or three days till he may be further examined. 10th of January, 1591, Richard Topcliffe is to be taken in an examination in the tower with George Beasley, seminary priest, and Robert Humbersome, his companion. And if you shall see good cause by their obstinate refusal to declare the truth of such things as shall be laid to their charge in Her Majesty's behalf, then shall you, by authority hereof, commit them to the prison called Little Ease, or to such other ordinary places of punishment as hath been accustomed to be used in those cases, and to certify proceedings from time to time. From the torture cell of Little Ease we move on to St. Catherine's Wheel, or been broken on the wheel. This public torture and execution is an old one, and has been around since medieval times. The breaking on St Andrew's Cross and breaking on the wheel or St Catherine's wheel. As with nearly all the executions recounted in this episode, the execution was public in the hopes of seeing the torturous painful execution would act as a deterrent to crime. In this method of execution, the prisoner would be placed in a public location and tied to the floor. The wheel used for the torture was usually a regular cart wheel, sometimes with additional accoutrements, such as a blade, to make it more deadly and to increase the pain. Additionally, sharp-edged spikes or wooden shards could be placed under the prisoner in anticipation of the drop of the wheel on each limb to increase the pain for the prisoner. The heavy wheel would be dropped on the bones one by one, shattering them. Often this would start with the shin bones, working his way up to each limb one by one. It is at this point 
that possibly if mercy had been given, the final blow was to the head, putting the prisoner out of his misery. If the death was to be extended, the now broken body would be woven through the spokes of the wheel, or if this was not possible, tied to the wheel. From here, the prisoner could be left with the body tied to it. The wheel could be hung up for display similar to a crucifixion cross and left to be pecked at by birds or, if mercy was forthcoming, thrown onto a fire to be burned. The story of Robert Weir, convicted of murdering his master John Kincaid and executed by being broken on the wheel on the 16th of June, 1604, according to this source, is recounted here. From the Chambers Edinburgh Journal, 1832, the Lady of Warriston. The estate of Warriston near Edinburgh, now partly covered by the extended street of the metropolis on its northern side, is remarkable in local history for having belonged to a gentleman who in the year 1600 was cruelly murdered at the instigation of his wife. This unfortunate lady, whose name was Jean Livingston, was descended from from a respectable ancestry, being the daughter of Livingston, the laird of Dunipace in Stirlingshire, and at an early age was married to John Kincaid, the laird of Wrediston, who, it is believed, was considerably more advanced in years than herself. It is probable that this disparity of age laid the foundation of much domestic strife, and led to the tragic event now to be noticed. The ill-fated marriage and its results form the subject of an old Scottish ballad in which the proximate cause of the murder is said to have been a quarrel at the dinner table. It was at dinner as they sat, and when they drank the wine, how happy were the laird and the lady of Bonnie Wellestein. But he has spoken a word in jest, her answer was not good, and he has thrown a plate at her, made her mouth gush with blood. Which, owing to such a circumstance as it was here alluded to, or a bite which the laird is said to have inflicted upon her arm, is immaterial. The lady, who appeared to have been unable to restrain her malignant passions, conceived the diabolical design of having her husband assassinated. There was something extraordinary in the deliberation with which this wretched woman approached the awful gulf of crime. Having resolved on the means to be employed in the murder, she sent for a former servant of her father, Robert Weir, who lived in the neighbouring city. He came to the place of Wariston to see her, but it appears her resolution failed and he was not admitted. She again sent for him, and he again went. Again, he was not admitted. At length, on his being called a third time, he was introduced to her presence. Before this time, she found an accomplice in the nurse of her child. It was then arranged that Weir should be concealed in a cellar till the dead of night, when he should come forth and proceed to destroy the laird as he lay in his chamber. The bloody tragedy was acted precisely in accordance with this plan. Weir was brought up at midnight from the cellar to the hall by the lady herself, and afterwards went forward alone to the laird's bedroom. As he proceeded to do his bloody work, she retired to her bed to wait the intelligence of her husband's murder. When Weir entered the laird's chamber, Wollaston awoke with the noise and leant inquiringly upon the bed. The murderer then leapt upon him, and the unhappy man uttered a great cry. Weir gave him some severe blows on vital parts, particularly one on the flank vein, but as the Lord was still able to cry out, he at length 
saw fit to take more effective measures. He seized him by the throat with both hands, and compressing that part with all his force, succeeded after a few minutes in depriving him of life. When the lady heard her husband's first death shout, she leapt out of bed in an agony of mingled terror and repentance, and descended to the hall, but she made no effort to countermand her mission of destruction. She waited patiently till Weir came down to inform her that all was over. Weir made an immediate escape from justice, but Lady Wollaston and the nurse were apprehended before the deed was half a day old. Being caught, as the Scottish law terms it, red-handed, that is, while still bearing unequivocal marks of guilt, they were immediately tried by the magistrate of Edinburgh and sentenced to be strangled and burnt at the stake. The lady's father, the laird of Dunipace, who was a favourite of King James the Sixth, made all the interest he could with his majesty to procure a pardon, but all that could be obtained from the king was in an order that the unhappy lady should be executed by decapitation, and that at such an early hour in the morning as to make the affair as little of a spectacle as possible. The space intervening between her sentence and her execution was only thirty-seven hours. Yet in that time, Lady Wollaston contrived to become converted from a blood-stained and unrelating murderess into a perfect saint on earth. One of the then ministers of Edinburgh has left an account of her conversation, which was later published, and would be extremely amusing, were it not for the loathing which seized the mind on beholding such an instance of perverted religion. She went to the scaffold with a demeanour which would have graced a martyr. Her lips were incessant in the utterance of pious exclamations. She professed herself confident of everlasting happiness. She even grudged every moment which she spent in this world as so much taken from that sun of eternal felicity which she was to enjoy in the next. The people who came to witness the last scene, instead of having their minds inspired with a salutary horror for her crime, were engrossed in admiration of her saintly behaviour, and greedily gathered up every devout word which fell from her tongue. It would almost appear from the narrative of the clergyman that her fate was rather a matter of envy than of any other feeling. Her execution took place at four in the morning on the 5th of July at the Watergate near Holyrood House, and at the same hour her nurse was burned on the Castle Hill. It is some gratification to know that the actual murderer, Weir, was eventually seized and executed, though not till four years afterwards. The time of the War of the Roses was highly unstable, and fortunes ebbed and flowed, dependent on whom you looked to be supporting. This execution story pits brother against brother, Drowned in a vat of wine, 1478. We do not have being drowned in a vat of wine used as a regular form of execution, but it is unique enough that we recount it here. George was brother to Edward IV, the first Yorkist king. On the 29th of June, 1461, George was given the title of the Duke of Clarence. In these uncertain times when the winds of change could blow unfavourably on you, George became known as a volatile and petulant man. The trouble which led to his execution began when his wife Isabel died three months after giving birth to a son 
who also died. Four months after his wife's death, George accused one of her ladies of having poisoned Isabel and had her arrested, tried and executed. George did not have the authority to exert his power of position in this way. He had also burst into a council meeting taking place with the king. Edward had his brother arrested. Evidence was collected and it seemed unlikely that a reprieve for George was on the cards. In this time of English history, plots, manipulations and schemes were the order of the day and George was found guilty of treason against his brother, the king. Folk folklore has it that George was drowned in a vat of Malmsey, an expensive sweet wine, but in truth we do not know. George was executed in private. There were superstitions regarding the shedding of royal blood, and it could be that Edward chose drowning, the form of execution used in Scotland until the 18th century, as the preferred way to execute his brother without shedding blood. Interestingly, George's daughter, Margaret Poole, the Countess of Salisbury, is shown wearing a barrel charm on a bracelet. One wonders if this was a remembrance of her father. Beheadings were not in any way unique, whether by axe or by sword, but it was bloody and so very often went disastrously wrong. Beheadings were a messy business, nearly always requiring more than one swing of the axe. There are records showing beheadings as the military punishment amongst Romans. The head of the victim was placed on a block with a pit alongside to catch the head as it fell. This mode of capital punishment was first introduced into this country from Normandy and William the Conqueror in 1076. Since then, this mode of execution became frequent, particularly in the reign of Henry VIII. It was customary for many years to execute traitors either within the precincts of the tower or else on Tower Hill. The axe, even under favourable circumstances, requires a repetition of the blow. This was equally true of the sword. Examples of the messiness of beheadings is recounted with the two famous beheadings under the executioner, Jack Ketch. Jack Ketch was the executioner who beheaded Lord Russell and the Duke of Monmouth. Lord Macaulay, in referring of the execution of the Duke of Monmouth, reported, Lord Monmouth accosted Jack Ketch, the executioner, a wretch whose name has, during a century and a half, been regularly given to all who succeeded him. Here, said the Duke, are six guineas for you. Do not hack me as you did my Lord Russell. I have heard you struck him three or four times. My servant will give you some gold if you do the work well. Lord Russell, as we recounted it in our episode on executions, was a botched execution, taking four blows to finally behead him. Folklore has it that after the first failed blow of the axe, Lord Russell looked up at the executioner, Jack Ketch, and said, You dog, did I give you ten guineas to use me so inhumanely? The Countess of Salisbury Margaret Pole, the Countess of Salisbury, was the only surviving daughter of George, Duke of Clarence, and came from the Plantagenet line. In 1509, Henry VIII married Catherine of Aragon, and Margaret was appointed one of her ladies-in-waiting. It was a difficult time to be in anyone's side, and Margaret was arrested for treason. The venerable Countess was executed in a similar manner on the May 27th, 1541. When directed to lay her head on the block, she refused to do it, saying she knew of no guilt and would not submit to die like a criminal. 
folklore has it that the executioner pursued her around the scaffold, aiming at her hoary head, and at length took it off, after mangling her neck and shoulders in a reportedly horrifying manner. With the difficulties associated with beheadings, a cleaner and more surgical procedure was looked for to reduce the many botched beheadings. One such device was the flat pack maiden that could travel and be put together in quick time. The maiden, in use for public executions from 1564 to 1774, the maiden chopped off the head by the descent of an axe loaded with lead. It was made use of in England long before the use of the guillotine was used in France. The English mode of decapitation was usually by the block and axe as described above, with one local exception, that of which was called the Halifax gibbet, which was indeed a perfect guillotine. Its last use in England was 1774. The instrument called the Maiden is still in existence in Edinburgh in 1872. The Maiden in Scotland. Interestingly, the very person believed to have introduced the idea of using the Maiden as an alternative to the messy beheadings was James Douglas. James Douglas, 4th Earl of Morton, ruled Scotland during the minority of James VI between 1572 and 1578. He was known to be ruthless in dealing with Mary, Queen of Scots' supporters. Douglas was implicated in the murder of, of Mary's second husband, Lord Darnley, who was murdered on the 10th of February, 1567 aged 21, in Edinburgh, Scotland. The arrest for this crime came 13 years after Dandy's death in 1580 and was considered to be politically motivated at the time. The trial took place at Edinburgh's Tollbooth on the 1st of June, 1581. The jury consisted of many of his old enemies, some of whom had previously been imprisoned by Douglas, Lord Morton. Douglas was found guilty and sentenced to be hanged. However, King James VI intervened and ordered Douglas to be executed by the very instrument of death he had introduced, the maiden. The guillotine was another version of the maiden and was rather diminished by the English in, as we thought it first, a kind of way. The guillotine, popular in France as a form of execution from 1792 to 1977. The guillotine slices the head off, entering on one side of the neck at an oblique edge. It was invented for the purpose of causing painless and immediate death. English records show that a physician named Joseph Ignatius Guillotine claimed to be the inventor of the deadly instrument, although other records state the inventor Antoine Louise. There was, however, little originality in the supposed invention, it being in reality but a modification or improvement upon the maiden used in Scotland many years before, and the similar engine of destruction had been used in Halifax in Yorkshire. The most notorious use of the guillotine would be its use of killing King Louis the Sixteenth and his family, as is recounted here. It is said that the king, when he mounted the scaffold, looked over to the pedestal of his grandfather, King Louis the Fourteenth statue, then to the entire pavilion of his own devastated palace. When he endeavoured to address the people, he turned his left towards Rue Royale, and Mercer tells us he was seized from behind by his executioners, and in spite of his desire 
to be allowed to finish what he had to say, he was bound to the bascule or balancing plank, and that, either from the form of his struggle or from the bascule being fitted for a taller person, the axe fell closer to his head than usual, and there was more mutilation than ordinary. Transcribed from Proudhomme, accepted as a trustworthy witness, describing the immediate aftermath of the beheading of King Louis the Sixteenth. Some individuals steeped their handkerchiefs in his blood. A number of armed officers crowded also to dip in the blood of the despot, their pikes, their bayonets, or their sabres, and carrying their points on high, exclaimed, This is the blood of a tyrant! One citizen got up to the guillotine itself, and plunging his whole arm into the blood of the basket, of which a great quantity remained, he took handfuls of the clotted gore and sprinkled it over the crowd below, who were pressed around the scaffold, each anxious to receive a drop on his forehead. A last story in this collection involves a unique form of torturous death known as gatching. We were unaware of this form of torture and execution until it was spotted as a foreign report from Persia. Gatching, a 19th century execution. Gatching is a form of execution that was used in Persia, now Iran. In essence, a pit is dug with a stake in it. The prisoner is placed in the pit attached to the stake and plaster of Paris is poured into the pit and then the spectators wait. The plaster of Paris is thrown into the pit followed by a bucket of water and then repeated with more plaster of Paris and more water whilst the prisoner is still chained to the stake on the pit. The plaster slowly hardens, and the prisoner is crushed. The practice is recorded being used in the mid-nineteenth century, but was revived in 1896, as recorded from a correspondent reporting from Persia. From the Yorkshire Evening Post, June 1896, The Hideous Form of Execution A hideous form of execution which has not been practised for twenty years was revived the other day to strike terror into the hearts of the people, says a Persian correspondent of the graphic. The murder of the Shah was followed by a succession of robberies on the road between Bushya and Isapan. At this juncture, H.R.H. Rudhid Ed Daula, governor of Shiraz, marched out of prison five men who, common reports said, had been there for the last five months and had had nothing whatever to do with the matter, but had merely been brought from the south because they refused to pay the excessive taxes imposed on them. These men were to be executed to frighten the people by being buried alive in plaster of Paris. This form of execution is called gatching and consists of a hollow pillar being erected over a pole about two feet deep so that the hole forms a well into which the prisoner is put sometimes the most merciful method head downwards and at others with his head sticking out over the top plaster of paris is then emptied in and between each basket full of water is poured down the well the gatch then swells, and when it hardens, it stops the circulation, causing the most excruciating agony. At 9am on Sunday, the May the 10th, the five prisoners chained neck to neck were marched out of prison and slowly escorted by a large mob who were kept from pressing too close by soldiers with fixed bayonets and others with long sticks. They were taken to the Koran Gate, near the Bag-i-Nor, on the town side of which 
alongside the road their wells had been prepared. It took one hour to read the Baginor, but the torture of this form of execution being unknown to the prisoners, they walked along without a sign of fear. They were taken into a high-walled garden, a guard being placed at the entrance, and in a short time the first to be executed was brought out. Round his neck was a steel collar with a chain, which his guard held tightly in his hand. Someone offered him a pitcher of water from which he eagerly drank, and then, not knowing what an awful death he was doomed, he walked calmly and without a word to his well. It took nearly half an hour to fill the well with gatch, during which time the sticks of the soldiers were in use to keep the crowd from pressing too close and hampering the movements of those employed with the gatch. After this, the second was brought out, and as the crowd moved to the well prepared for him, I took a photograph which shows the man buried up to the chin, his face covered with powdered gatch, and his eyes closed, so as not to see the crowd standing round. The gatch has not yet begun to set, and the man is suffering no pain. I then hurried from the spot, and only just in time, as I afterwards heard, to escape the most heart-rending scenes, when the gatch becomes solid and tightened on the poor prisoner. His yells were frightful to listen to, and as they were carried over the walled garden, those waiting their turn realised that the death to which they were doomed, so far from being the painless one they had hoped for, was instead of a terrible nature. As the fourth man was led from the garden, he begged the executioner to take him to the bazaar, where he would find someone to give him ten tumans, which is about two pounds, after which he would cut his head off. The fifth man became even more frantic as the yells issued from the mouths of his companions. Spare me, spare me, he cried, and I will show you where two thousand tumans, four hundred pounds, lay hid but his offer came too late. When three days later I passed along the road, I found capitals that had been added to the pillars, covering the heads of the poor men who had thus horribly been done to death. That concludes this history news collection of stories and punishments of execution methods. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please Subscribe and tell your friends. Subscribing really helps. We are aiming for 1,000 subscribers. If you have already subscribed, our sincere thanks for your support. We very much appreciate it. For our podcast listeners, you can see this podcast with the associated pictures on our YouTube channel at News of the Times. You can find the link in the show notes. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.